a, a way to define nations that are digital. But actually, there is a network, a collaborative network of a few countries that are very advanced on digitization. Um, they support each other, they have set standards in how uh, countries should become more digital and why uh, they can do so. And it used to be digital five, then it became digital seven, then it became digital nine, and now it's digital nations, so it's 10 countries actually. And if I read the membership, is Canada, Denmark, Estonia, Israel, Mexico, New Zealand, Portugal, Republic of Korea, so South Korea, United Kingdom, and Uruguay. These 10 countries basically have worked very hard to set some standard in uh, how countries can become digital nations. And I mean, I, we don't need to go through all of them, but just to give you a, a gist of how a country can truly be digital and not only you know, have a cool website. First of all is user needs. So the first principle they put forward in everything they do is to focus the design of public services on the needs of citizens. So exactly as a company, uh, as a digital company, a digital country is the one that serves citizens at its best. So they put at the center the user needs. Uh, then they have other standards like open source, open standards, open market. So uh, it's inherently a collaborative approach where um, people and other institutions can learn from each other. Um, and then obviously there is a lot of focus on connectivity infrastructure to ensure that most people can have access um, to digital services of, of a government, not only young uh, skilled people, but anyone, um, and also not only those can, they can afford the tools to access a digital nation. Um, and then basically a final commitment to share and learn and ensure that as many nations as possible learn from each other and, uh, and basically develop into a digital nation. Can I ask you, so I always found digital nations super cool, or like my very small understanding of it very cool. How do they manage to come across the digital gap, right? Like if you think the easiest example is obviously seniors, but if you think of seniors and um, they don't have as much access to, or, or don't necessarily know how to use just as well uh, internet services, for example, digital services. And um, there's a lot of people in every single country that are left behind that don't have access to digital services. And um, there's a lot of families that have, might share some devices um, with a lot of members, which means they don't have regular access to those digital services. How are those countries kind of overcoming this? So I think there are a lot of strategies for that, but I, I, my impression is that how, for example, Estonia has done it, is to put their money where their mouth is. So Estonia, since 1999 or 1998, has committed 1% of their GDP per year to IT and infrastructure development of IT. This means that not only is we advance of many funds, but actually they allocate a lot of funds. And allocating a lot of funds means, for example, giving digital connectivity to remote parts of the countries, or ensuring that those that are underprivileged receive the tools through schools or through other systems to actually participate in a digital ecosystem. So I think that's something that definitely differentiates what Estonia has done compared to many other nations that they put, they actually invested a lot of money into, into this project, into this vision of digitization. And money means that there's a lot of support for those that are, are not privileged enough to already have the capacity or the, the tools to connect. Okay. Um, and then I'm sure there are many, pro many other programs, education uh, efforts that have been done. But I was really impressed by that because basically, if I can go one second on the example of Estonia, which is actually the first example that I want to cover. So there are a lot of interesting uh, data, but I think the history is very interesting. So Estonia, it's a former Soviet Republic, it's a small country positioned in Eastern Europe, um, became independent in 1991. And it was a very poor country with a lot of Soviet era infrastructure. So um, not really how do you say, uh, advanced technology available. And there was a moment where basically Finland was switching from analog, so like, uh, uh, how do say, land-based land uh, phones to digital, um, and so cell phones. 
And so Finland. When was that? I think this was in 1992. Okay. And basically, they offered to give it for free. So Finland was like, look, we can help you to modernize. You should get our old analog uh, system. And Estonia refused. And they said, no, we're not going to basically follow this path of being always a step before, uh, behind everyone. But we'll try the, what they call the leapfrog. Not the okay. tiger leap, but the tiger leap. <laughs> this, I don't know how to pronounce it in Aston. Um, and actually go ahead everyone. And so they completely avoided creating a phone infrastructure like most countries had in, in, the, in those decades and actually moved directly to, um, to mobile phones. Uh, and they did this thing of investing 1% of GDP for IT. Um, and basically they really, really focus on, on this as their only way to survive and matter. And I think an incredible number that I saw by 1997, 97% of Estonian schools had an internet connection. Wow. I mean, I think that today in Italy, but even in the UK, maybe, I'm not sure that 97% of Estonian school, uh, of, uh, schools have an internet connection. What do you think about this number? I think it's huge. I mean, in 1997, I don't know if I had an internet connection. <laughs> exactly. It's crazy, right? Um, and basically, since 2000, they could uh, um, declare uh, taxes online. So, I mean, it's, it's complete, it's like 15 years before the rest of the world, 10 years before the rest of, at least the world, at least of uh, Europe. Um, no, sorry, today in France, 96% of schools have an internet connection. So they were 25 years ahead of France, and they're still ahead of France, yeah. 25 years late. Crazy. So it's crazy, right? And the services that Estonia offers are incredible. I mean, they have e-taxes, as I said, e-business, e-banking, e-schools, university via, via internet, e-governance, i-voting, so everyone can vote online. Um, and they have the aim by 2030 to have a high-speed internet available everywhere, the best government service, digital government service in the world, and a country cyberspace that is reliable and safe. So incredible stuff. And what struck me more, so first of all, Estonia, let's say, apart from doing great themselves, they also come, come themselves out a huge influence across the planet uh, as a small state through the incredible innovation. So now countries are actually looking for advice. They, there was an article saying that Germany was interested in flying a, a whole team from Estonia, from the government of Estonia to learn how to digitize, digitize the country. So incredible benefits from this move. Um, and in addition, is also very open. So I went on their website called eEstonia. This is kind of the website that unify all the efforts for Estonia, that Estonia has made to become digital. And you can book two consultations with them. One is just a free tour of um, I don't know, the, the facilities, I suppose, the, the, the ministers. And the other one is a two-hour session with experts on their teams to learn about best practices. It's completely free, which is incredible. And that's kind of their principle of like showing the world that this can be done. And it's open source in a way. It's not only about them. So I find it incredibly powerful. But Colum, do you have anything to say about all of this? Um, I just remember the whole debate uh, about e-voting. So every election we talk about, you know, e-voting and so on. Um, and I remember thinking... Well, you know, if Estonia managed to introduce e-voting 15 years ago, why can't we do it? Uh, and so I was just Googling it at the same time to, tri to triple check. And actually, there's a Washington Post and Guardian article saying that the infrastructure is not safe. Yeah, but I mean, as far as I, as I know, they vote online. And as far as I know, they have, for example, a very strong stance against Russia. And they keep on being, um, I mean... I don't, I don't think the Russian managed to sway any leadership of, of Estonia's family. I mean, Estonia is probably the, champ, the, the strongest partner. So according to the Washington Post, if Moscow wanted to take the opportunity to meddle in Estonia as a first, according to research by an international team of security experts, it could do so cleanly and silently without anyone being the wiser. And when was this uh, from? 2014. It's a 2014. while ago. Because now it runs completely on blockchain. Yeah. So probably, yeah, probably. fixed a lot of uh, vulnerabilities. 
Yeah, I'm sure that voting is always uncertain. Just like looking at, it, at Estonia's running since 25 years, is clearly very strong. Yeah, it raised one, its cyber defenses in 2017. And it's one of the strongest uh, opponents uh, of, of uh, Russia in the region, at least vocally, and of course, it's a small nation, so it's not a threat. But it's really, really vocal against against the country. Um, and still, I mean, they are still standing there. They vote online. They have a very anti, um, anti-authoritarian anti government. So clearly any effort to sway them or meddle into election did not work so far. Yeah. So this was an example of Estonia. So very interesting in feel um, and a great, great practice for everyone. And then I look in Taiwan. But before going to Taiwan with my research, I want to ask Colom, who is the maximum expert of a Taiwan our team. <laughs> Um, what do you think about Taiwan as a digital nation? What you like? I love Taiwan's digital nation. <laughs> and, but for the fine girling, and so I'm aware of a few things. I know that Taiwan uses digital tools in order to further digital democracy. So it uses tools like polis and other tools like this to enable citizens um, and different stakeholders to participate in decision-making processes um, on, for example, hot topics. So it uses digital tools to help in coming to a consensus on how to legalize Uber, how to legalize the sale of online alcohol, and much more. It also um, has strong partnerships with hackers and the hacker civil society. And um, so, for example, during the pandemic, uh, it worked with hackers to have um, an open source, and as a result, it was more trusted, from what I understand, tool to be able to log where you had masks and PPE equipment across the country live so that people would have access to this without queuing for hours and having access to reliable information. And I think from a young age, people consider the use of digital tools as a way of furthering democracy. So I remember during presidential debates, um, students were fact-checking online information uh, that president or, or wannabe presidents were putting out. Um, so I think those are just examples of how digital tools are used in Taiwan to further democracy. Um, I, I find it very, very cool to be able to, to uh, use innovative tools to, for example, gamify consensus, manage to go beyond deadlocks and polarization. So I remember Audrey Tang saying that the tools they use are basically the opposite of Facebook in a way. Like uh, they said, you know, I asked a question about polarization and how they managed to go beyond it, going more and more digital. And they said it depends on, on the tools. If you try to have a political debate in a nightclub, which is Facebook, um, it wouldn't need too much. But if you had it in a highly moderated and healthy room, then potentially you'll come to a better agreement. And so I think Taiwan very much has this vision, from what I understand, of using digital tools in order to go beyond um, polarization and, and tough topics. So I find it very, very cool. I think, however, on my question of how you, know, you can go beyond the digital gap, they have, for example, phone hotlines to be able to participate in certain processes, get access to information, and so on, for those who are not literate digitally or who might not have access to the internet. Sorry, I'm really tired. <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Ah, and finally, they have a digital minister, which is a very cool role. They have what? A digital minister. Now it's called Minister of Digital Affairs. They just step up here. It's not anymore a minister without portfolio, but it's a full minister. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. So what I wanted to add, I mean, I think you presented everything, basically. <laughs> I'm sorry. So it's, no, it's very good. I mean, that's the strength of Taiwan. It's not only offering services like Estonia, which is already impressive, but Taiwan took more, I think, the, the alley of improving democracy through technology. So creating consensus and support across society, thanks to technological tools and processes, which is very impressive. And something that I read that I didn't know is that not only they do all these consultations so on, but actually they have a very cool um, uh, system online where you can, if you get a 5,000 signatures on the government website, this trigger a whole process that um, uh, trigger basically on co collaborative meetings held online with ministers, with other parties, with stakeholders to basically uh, reach a legislation they on the topic, which is very interesting because it's completely different to what most Western nations do. There is or Western, I mean, most democratic nations do. There is the one of filing a petition, then there is a referendum or a petition to parliament, right? Here is you file a petition, and then if you're successful, 
actually it starts a process where you really try to get to a result altogether. So again, it's a different mindset. And I don't know if, if the result is guaranteed, which is interesting, but there is a big effort from society as a whole, from government as a whole, to lead to a, a result. Which I find it very, very fascinating. Um, and I think that it's also basically part of the reason why all the processes that have been, have been created in the past, the one to deal with Uber and similar, have been successful because these tools are accessible to anyone. So very impressive. So Taiwan and uh, Estonia are definitely two nations that are very, very advanced in this space. I mean, we both live for a in the United Kingdom and to be in the United Kingdom is part of the Digital Nations Initiative. And it's definitely fairly advanced. I mean, you can open companies online for 30 pounds. You can pay your taxes fully online. You can deal with most bureaucratic things fully online. And it's very, very efficient. So while... I mean, I keep on being logged out of every single online service, but yeah. But I think this is part of the game. <laughs> like to pay my taxes, I think I have to log 10 times into yeah. the system. It's not, it's not optimal. But I'm sure that in Estonia and in Taiwan, they will tell you something. No, I know, I know. I'm, I'm just smooth. bitching about it. <laughs> so what I want to say is that while the United Kingdom is way behind in terms of democratic participation and democratic norms, is really advanced, for example, in user, user centrism. Public, um, public services are available to anyone. They are very simple to access. And basically, if you go on the UK government website, it looks a bit, I always try to make, um, to compare to a very advanced digital company like Amazon or similar. It's very intuitive how you get from A to B and what are the numbers that you have to add. It's, it's very simple to follow. And I think this is a great achievement of, of the British government. Having said that, what can we learn, Colom, from digital nations for our endeavor? Do you have any idea after this presentation? And so one, I think digital services, and we didn't even look at countries that, for example, um, unable debates or whatever in the metaverse. I'm sure there's some cities that are already doing so, etc. cetera. Yeah. But I think digital services and a digital political platform enables people from all across the world to come together and have access to similar services. So if you had a democratic global governance and um, having access to digital services would be absolutely fundamental to pay taxes, receive subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. It would be fundamental. Also to be able to participate in political processes, to voice your opinion, and to be able to collaborate on pieces of legislation and so on, it would be extremely important. Yeah. So I think there's a lot we can we can learn here and a lot we should apply to a um, global governance uh, because of course I like, ease of access, rapidity of execution, um, inclusivity will be fundamental topic for anything global in nature. Uh, without it, it's impossible. Like, we'll never be able to extend bureaucratic uh, um, institution across the planet without a, an incredibly amazing digital effort. So I think that what we learn from here is that there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot that's already been done across the planet. It has to become a common knowledge and uh, be very, very um, to everyone. Having said that, for today we are done. I think tomorrow, as the last live of the, of the week, we will focus on innovative digital institutions. Like, for example, the network state. There's a proposal of um, crypto person of how we can we could create um, basically digital nations online. They are decentralized and compete with each other. Um, and I'm sure there is much more in the space. We still need to research it. But basically, we did micronation, we did digital nation. Now let's try to do digital micronations and see what happens with, when we mesh these topics. We mash them together. We mash them. Beautiful. So we'll talk tomorrow. I saw people commenting that Bilbao has a great distro agenda and giving other best practices. Please send them our way. Um, and we can't wait to read them and to come up with conclusions at the end of the week. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.